take it a little further and, and ask ourselves, well, why is it that the nervous system does this? Why is it that the nervous system controls and coordinates all other organs and structures and relates the individual to his environment? The best way to answer that is to really look at some, some ancient wisdom, if you will. We can go back and read this famous quote, the only constant in life is change. And, and you know, <laughs> we could certainly uh, agree that today in particular, we're, we're experiencing this idea of, of change and, and how we, we deal with it. So, so change by itself uh, can also be called stress. Uh, in fact, when you talk to or you listen to uh, Hans Selye, who coined the term stress and did uh, preliminary experiments on stress, he was once asked, well, how would you define stress in, in the most basic way? And, and he said, well, the most basic way to explain stress is to just think of it as change. Uh, really, any change that occurs uh, inside of us or around us, the nervous system is there to respond to it. So change is stress and stress is change. Change is stressful because it challenges our survival. And the nervous system has mechanisms to adapt to stress to keep us alive. Really the bottom line of what our nervous system does and what I like to say if, if ever you're studying neurology and you're you're getting lost in all the complexity of it all. And you say, well, why? I wonder why this neuron does that or why this, this behavior occurs. Or the answer is always, it's there to keep us alive. The nervous system is there to help us survive. So the next question you may ask is, well, how exactly does the nervous system do this? How does it accomplish its function? To answer that, we have to start with the fact that it requires information. In order for it to properly do its job, the nervous system requires information. So just like satellite dishes that are always there and ready to, to respond to information, we are inundated with receptors. Uh, we have internal receptors. So we can imagine these satellite dishes inside our body, uh, in all of our tissues, really in, in the blood vessels to signal you know, any sort of changes in diameter or, or tension in the blood vessels, um, angle, angulation of the joints, tension in muscles, any sort of problematic area like, like pain. Uh, and of course, we need to know what's happening in our heart. We need to know what's happening in our lungs and our, our digestive system to keep us alive in that very basic sense. We also have extra receptors, the, the senses. The senses are there to give information to the brain as far as what's happening around us. So with the intro receptors and the extra receptors, the brain is able to get all that information from around us to interpret it and then to be able to respond appropriately. So we are inundated with these receptors. The receptor's job is basically to send information into the CNS. And then if the CNS can process and interpret this information, it can respond. The interesting thing, especially for us as chiropractors, is the way that the nervous system responds is by one very simple and direct method. To move things is all that mankind can do. And for this task, the sole executant is a muscle, whether it be whispering a syllable or felling a forest. When we think about it, we know that we have these different types of muscular tissues in our body, and they all serve a function that is essentially to keep us alive, to adapt to stress. That is the job of the nervous system. We're basically marionettes. We're at the mercy of how the nervous system controls our muscles. So here we are, we have a body that sends sensory information to the central nervous system. The central nervous system then responds through motor circuits. And this beautiful simplification of how the nervous system works is known as the safety pin cycle introduced by BJ Palmer. So it's a, it's a really wonderful way to kind of examine the nervous system with your patients, think about it in that way when you're doing your exams, and, and also to understand better what we're, what we're doing when we talk about adjustments as well. Now, if we get more specific into our, our core interest and the topic at hand, it's where our main interest is really the part of the body known as the spinal column, right? So when we're talking about 
reduced motion, we can talk about derangements or, or, or stresses in the spine. And, and how does that fit into this whole scheme of the, uh, the safety pin cycle? In other words, if we have a mechanical stress, what effect will that have on the nervous system? And this is really where uh, most of the talks of, uh, about how the nervous system is related to the subluxation, this is really where we're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of flow, a lot of, of the new developments in our research and, and a better understanding of the neurological effects of reduced motion. So mechanical stress, what do I mean by that? Well, we know as chiropractors that there's many different ways or many different scenarios that can cause mechanical stress or strain on the body, whether it's postural faults, uh, bad habits of, 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 of sitting or standing in different ways. Obviously, accidents uh, will cause mechanical stress on the body. But can mechanical stress reduce spinal motion? Or, or how is it that it might reduce spinal motion? If we look at an example here, here's somebody who has a, a mechanical stress. This is an area in their spine that is not moving properly, whether it was from a bad posture, a fall, what have you. Mechanical stress has caused this area to be fixated. What we know from a neurological point of view is when an area of the body is not moving properly, this is sensed or perceived as a harm. Uh, this, is a, this can potentially damage the, uh, the area in question. This is, this is not good. So the nervous system in, in its wisdom to protect the body and to stay alive uh, will signal the central nervous system. And that signal is, is basically called nociception. The, the, the perception or the transmission of potential harm uh, into the central nervous system. Now we know from what we just said about the safety pin cycle that we expect a response from the CNS and at the spinal cord level, that's exactly what happens. We have a motor response. So here's our safety pin. And we said that how does it respond to, to stress? It responds by muscle contraction. So it makes great sense that without knowing anything more, we're at the spinal cord level. So there's no consciousness involved here. We have reflexes, the most simple stimulus response circuitry known in the nervous system that will protect, brace an area that is dysfunctional. An interesting uh, thing to, 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 to discuss as well from a clinical point of view is, well, what happens if this isn't fixed? What happens if this goes on for a long time? And if you can just think of, you know, putting an arm in a cast, for example, or what we know about degeneration is over time, a joint that doesn't move will degenerate. We, we know that very clearly, and we can just simply take x-rays to, to diagnose that. And what will happen to the muscle? You know, the, the, the nervous system, is it going to maintain, is it going to expend all its energy to maintain that muscle spasm? No. After a certain amount of time, the muscle will atrophy, just like the, the arm in the cast, right? We know how muscles atrophy over time when there's no movement. So this is an example of what happens at, at the spinal cord level. Uh, but we also obviously have to signal the brain. If, if there's an issue, if there's a problem, a potential threat, of course we need to signal the brain. And, and from a musculoskeletal point of view, obviously there, there's a lot going on here and we're just gonna kind of summarize the most important points. But the brain is also gonna react to this, this dysfunction, uh, but it's gonna do it in a more complex way. So for example, if an area is irritated in your spine, uh, or painful, uh, the brain is fantastic at changing your posture, right? Antalgia, it's gonna actually contract other parts of your spine in order to relieve the irritation that you might have in another area. So while there might be a, uh, a primary area of dysfunction, we can now create muscle tension or reduced motion in other areas to protect ourselves or to reduce this irritation. This is what chiropractors often call secondary subluxations or compensations. Now that's from a postural point of view. We can also talk about well, what, what would happen when, when somebody moves. And if any of you have ever had like a shoulder injury or a knee injury, you know that it, it changes the way you move as well. So disrupted motor patterns will occur. Rather than moving the way you normally do, your entire body can get affected into disrupted or new motor patterns to, to avoid this irritation. So patterns of normal proprioceptive input 
are profoundly distorted when articular nociceptive activity is added. This interferes with the normal patterns of motion, balance, coordination, and equilibrium. So we see that mechanical stress can induce uh, or can reduce spinal motion, both at the spinal cord level through muscle, through protective muscle bracing, or through uh, higher centers causing things like antalgia or disrupted motor patterns. What if the CNS is stressed? And this is where I think things get really interesting when we're, we're talking about reduced joint motion or, or subluxation. In other words, when we look at our, our safety pin cycle, what if that part of the safety pin is stressed? What if the central nervous system is stressed? What effect will that have on the body? And a simple example that we can use that's, that's very logical is, is stroke. So we know if someone has a stroke, this is a central nervous system or a neurological stress, we're going to have physical manifestations from that stress, right? So, so when somebody has a, a stroke posture, uh, you don't think to yourself, gee, you know, I wonder what's happening in his elbow or why does his elbow have a problem or why does his wrist have a problem? We say, no, the problem is up here. So we can look at the body, we can examine the body and, and decide or, or infer what might be happening uh, in the central nervous system that causes problems in the motor system. Of course, once again, our primary concern is the spine. So when we talk about reduced motion at the spine, what may be some neurological uh, stresses that cause um, changes in muscle tone around the spine, just like the stroke patient. So we can ask ourselves, can neurological stress reduce spinal motion? Well, to answer that question, we're going to do two things. We're going to first talk about normal function of, of the brain and the nervous system and how it relates to spinal tone. And then we're going to talk about, well, what happens when things are dysfunctional? So the brain controls spinal tone. That's, that's uh, one of its primary functions. So from the brain stem to all other areas of the, of the brain that integrate with the brain stem, spinal tone is controlled by the brain. We also know that as we evolved, as our, as our nervous system, as our brain evolved over time, this is directly correlated to our ability to stand erect. So the, the, our very ability to be biped creatures is uh, a neurological phenomenon. It's, it's, it's due to the brain and its, its evolution. So if you have poor spinal tone, in other words, if you have a neurological stress in the central nervous system that's gonna have an impact or a negative impact on spinal tone, we're now in a position where we see head forward posture as an example. So head forward posture from a neurological point of view is related to a lack of, of tone. Uh, all of these muscles, for example, are now less effective in maintaining an erect and well-aligned posture. And I like to give the example to my patients. So this is just like, you know, a tree that's falling and we have guy wires holding onto the tree, trying to keep it upright. All of these muscles in the back, and it's from the neck all the way down the, the spine, even all the way down to the, to the, uh, to the gastroxis, for example, all of these muscles are now going to be eccentrically loaded. They're going to be contracting. They're going to be squeezing the spine and reducing motion at the spine just to keep the person upright. And we know that the consequences on a, on a mechanical point of view are the typical degenerative changes that we see. And, and it's not a, a shock that we see the same areas most commonly affected by degeneration in the spine because the patterns are neurological and very common. We can also have asymmetry of spinal tone. In other words, if we have a difference between the left and the right side of the brain and how each side controls each side of the spine muscles, if we have an asymmetry from one side to another, we can expect things like lateral deviations in the spine or scoliosis. Another function of the spine and how it relates, another function of the brain and how it relates to the spine is um, how it stabilizes the spine. So for example, if you were to lift your arm up, this is actually a dangerous situation. Uh, why? Because your arm has weight. And 
if, if you don't compensate for that weight now away from your center of gravity, you are at risk of falling or you are at risk of damaging other parts of your body. So in the intelligence of the nervous system, before you even lift your arm, your brain will stabilize your spine. So it, it, what we call shunt stabilization. So, so first, before the signal gets to your actual arm or any other gross movement that you do, your brain will stabilize your spinal muscles in order to allow that movement to occur in a safe manner. So poor stabilization mechanisms in the, in the, in the brain obviously lead us to this classic scenario, right? Of the patient who says, I just bent over or I just reached for a pencil and ah, my back went out, right? So this is actually a mechanism or, or a demonstration of a poor stabilization mechanism related to the, the CNS. We know the brain also controls our balance, right? Why? Because it took us so long to be able to stand up. We want to make sure that we don't fall over. Uh, it's interesting to look at the, the anatomy of the body and how we're, we're really structured as three inverted pyramids stacked one on top of each other. Like This is absolutely amazing. We're a pendulum. We're an upside down pendulum. So the brain reserves a lot of energy and a lot of effort and a lot of circuitry just to keep us upright through balance mechanisms. So the flip side of that is if we have poor balance control, uh, we're going to have mechanical or, or motor consequences along the spine. If, if, for example, I have a derangement in my brain such that I, 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 I'm falling to the right, I'm constantly falling to the right, obviously the brain is going to try to compensate by stabilizing other muscles or, or contracting muscles around the spine to keep me from falling. When there's failure of that mechanism, then you fall. The brain also controls eye muscles. And, and I think this is a, an interesting area for us to, to really get into as chiropractors. Obviously, the neurology of, of eye muscles is, is very, very complex. But why it's important to us is because vision trumps the spine. And this is, this is, this is huge. <laughs> What, what do I mean by that exactly? What, what I mean by vision trumps the spine is that given the choice between having a spinal problem or a visual problem, the nervous system will choose to have a spinal problem. The, the, if, if you have weak ocular muscles, uh, as, as the example here is, if, if this person has weakness in a in torsion of the eyes, the nervous system will contract muscles in the spine to give you a new posture in order to reduce that visual disturbance. So, so eye, muscle, uh, eye, eye muscle exam, for example, is crucial if you're interested in posture, uh, if you're interested in concussions, we know that that's a really important thing to do if you're interested in dizziness. Uh, eye muscles are really, really an important part of, of what we do. Finally, we know that the brain controls emotion right? Emotions. So, so the, the emotional circuits of the brain are really built upon physical circuits. So why we think of emotion is that you can tell how somebody's feeling just by looking at their face, right? Their, their muscles of facial expression will tell you exactly how they're feeling. Their body posture, whether they're confident or, or depressed, will give you an immediate uh, input into what's happening in, in terms of their psychology. So when we think of emotional states, this can also have a direct impact on the spine. And there's not one chiropractor on the planet that doesn't agree that when a person is stressed emotionally, their spine is tighter, right? Their, 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 their areas of tension become more obvious. And this is all about fight or flight. We know that, that stress or psychological stress puts us in this fight or flight uh, scenario. And like we said about how the, the, the brain stabilizes the spine, if I'm in a fight or flight scenario where I'm going to have to use my muscles to fight or to run away in flight, before I can even do that, I need to make sure that my spine is stable or else I can't fight or flight. So, so spinal contraction in a, in a distressed state uh, helps us get in a ready mode in order to accomplish this. So yes, neurological stress can reduce spinal motion. 
So if you go from the example of the person who's had a stroke and how their, their limbs change in position or intention, we can apply it to the spine in different scenarios as well. So when you think about this, it's really a chicken or egg situation when we talk about reduced spinal motion. Here we are with, with the spine with reduced motion. And we know that it can be a cause of central nervous st stress. And, and, and we, we, we've got more and more research showing us this pathway. But what we should consider as well is that subluxation or reduced motion can also be a symptom of CNS stress or a problem in the CNS. So in summary, we've seen that we have different mechanical stresses and different neurological stresses that can have an impact on the tension and the motion in the spine. We've, say, we've seen how the nervous system has mechanisms to adapt to stress to keep us alive, which is its basic, most primordial function. We've seen that the nervous system responds to stress via muscle contraction. So this brings us into an interesting scenario where we can talk about what is the definition of a subluxation from a neurological point of view. And what I'm going to offer to you is this. Subluxation is a segmental motor adaptation to mechanical and neurological stress. <laughs>